read those first few verses. We're going to pause to be able to look at things about uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. We're still going to look at John and bring in some of uh, what he speaks about uh, to see the differences, but we're going to start with Luke, uh, Luke chapter uh, 18 or 19, verse 28. Uh, about this event as they go in for the triumphal entry. And when he, Jesus, had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass that when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. And I believe that's because uh, these people were not just robots. These people actually knew the Lord. And so the right person is going to meet the right person at the right time. And God's going to have influence in the whole thing. So the Lord already knows that and says, go ahead. You're going to say it and they're going to understand. We see it in the very next verse. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they let the colt go. And you know what? Who knows who God puts in your way or, or where you're at? Because God has key people in different places that he's going to use at the right time, the right place, the right moment. And uh, whether that's having the cold or whether that's having the upper room to be prepared for them, there's key people that God has positioned for things to come off. And, and many times you may be that person or somebody in your life will be that person for you. But the Lord knew you go ask, it's going to happen. So when God tells you something, when he leads you in something, when he says, this is what I need you to do, just be obedient to it. Just go and watch how God will line up things uh, to work out in what he has planned and purpose for you, because that's what he does. Now, let's go on to the next one. This is Matthew adds something to that event when he tells us this. Matthew 21, verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and setting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is a scripture reminding us that back in those days, if the king came or the conqueror came or, uh, you know, somebody came to you on the donkey, they were offering peace. If a ruler came and, and they wanted to offer the city peace, then they came on a donkey. That was the sign I'm not threatening here. That's the sign saying I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm offering you peace. And that's what he did. He's coming as their king, but he's offering peace to the city. Um, anybody ever seen some of these uh, biblical movies? And when you see the Roman soldier coming in or the commander, what's he always on? A white horse, that's right, he's on a white stallion. And what is he saying to them? You're the conquered. I'm here, and if you mess around, I'll take you out. That's what that sign is. When Jesus comes back in Revelation, he's got the crown on, he's got the, the royal vestures on, he's got written on him, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. What horse is he riding? A white horse. Because he's saying everybody who did not receive the peace is receiving the white horse now. He's coming to take, take over. So uh, let me just tell you, when, the, when, when Jesus shows up on the donkey, say yes. Invite him in. When he offers you the salvation he bought for you at the cross, say yes. Let him in. Get to know your Lord there. Because at the end of the age, when he comes back, he's going to be on the white horse. There's no more offer of peace. This is your time. This is your moment. This is our moment to receive Jesus on the donkey. This is our moment to let him into our city, into what we do, into our life, into our business, into our fellowship, into our surroundings. Everything we do, we need to accept Jesus in his offer of peace. Because when it's the other way around, things are a little different. And so that's what's going on here. Go to the next one. We go back to Luke 19 verse 35. 
Then they brought, brought the, 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 the colt to Jesus and they threw on their, their clothes onto the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Doesn't say what they were, but they'd seen mighty works. So there was people that were with him. And then as they got to uh, the descent, the whole group, everybody that wanted to be there was starting to show up and they were praising God because of the things they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they're saying, this is the one. Remember, they thought they were going to take over the city. They thought they were going to, 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 to watch a revolution. They thought, thought Jesus was going to go in and, and everything was about ready to go. But, but Luke here says that there was ones with them. And then by the time they got to the, the descent, they had a, the whole multitude of the disciples. So we know from a lot of the writings, that means the people that had come with him from Galilee uh, were all gathered together. And whether there was others, you know, it, it, you could take a little bit out of that. But we know all those people were there. Now we're going to add a little bit of John to the story. So remember when, when we talked about John's gospel that he is always doing something? What is he doing? Anybody remember? He's filling in. That's right. He is filling in the rest of the story. I mean, seriously, we're, we're going to go through this and you will find out he's doing it all the time. So here's this story and watch how John fills in the gaps. John 12, verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, which is why everybody was showing up to Jerusalem because of the feast. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So this is a group of people that was actually coming to the feast that had been influenced by something because when they heard Jesus was coming, they went out to meet him. You had the other group that was with Jesus and they're doing the, the clothes and they're right from the start. But then when they get to the, the descent of the hill, there's a whole bunch of people. And John says, there's this group of people who came together, they got the palm branches out. The other group, remember, they're throwing clothes down and all this, this group is doing palm branches. And look what he says. Go to the next verse. This is verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him, Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So this is the other group that we didn't hear about in any of the other Gospels. And so John adds it and says, there was also a multitude there who were hearing the witness of Lazarus. And so you had the people who came from Galilee and those who either saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead or the people who heard about it from those that were there and gave witness to it. So that's the whole crowd now. We have the people who came from Galilee, had dedicated the whole, that whole trip back uh, to Jerusalem. And then you had the people in Jerusalem who were being influenced by the resurrection of Lazarus. And John tells us those people were there too. And you may say, why, why, is, why is John having to fill us in on this? You would think if Lazarus had been raised from the dead, that the other three Gospels would have had that story. Did you ever think that? You ever wonder why you only read about Lazarus' story in John's Gospel? And you don't have to believe this. It's just what I believe. Uh, but, I, but I believe this about that story. In the same way that we didn't hear about who cut off the you know, the ear of the servant in the garden until John told us. He told us it was Peter because I believe Peter was passed at that point and he knew it wouldn't have a negative influence on his ministry. And he just said, you know, it was Peter. All the other people just said a disciple. They never identified who it was. Now, the inner group knew who it was. But, you know, they just said, you know what, for the writing of it, we're not going to 
let people keep hearing and thinking about Peter as the guy who will cut your ear off if you make him mad, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're, they're going to be nice to him. But then when he's passed, they, they said, you know what, it's okay, we'll, we'll say that. Uh, you know, I wish we would learn some of that. You know, a tell-all book is not a godly book. We're just going to tell it all. We won't help or protect or... Uh, I'm not talking about just protecting evil and all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying... There's things you don't have to say that would hurt people. You don't have to say all that stuff. You know, you can hold it in. There comes a time and place that maybe it can be said, or you say it like they said it. They said it without a name. They tell the story, but they don't tell the name. They, so they're protecting the person a little bit. So think about this. John tells us that when Jesus came back to eat there with Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead, John then tells us, that he's on the Pharisee death list. He says they're plotting to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. Well, they got Jesus. Come on, are you getting this? They got Jesus, but they didn't get Lazarus yet. And guess who avoided the, the what three gospel writers avoided the whole story of Lazarus? Because I believe they were irritated at Jesus and they were irritated at Lazarus. They were trying to kill the resurrected man. Can you imagine that? You know, we want him to be dead twice. You know, they had no understanding of God, but they wanted to kill him. And I believe the disciples protected Lazarus. And they didn't tell the story. They didn't stir it up. They just let Lazarus be protected or what, for whatever reason. They didn't even tell the story because the story was obviously out there people were coming from all over because of it and then when John comes 50 some years later I believe there's no problem Jerusalem has been destroyed that whole power group is no longer a power group and they can tell who Lazarus is and now we get the story Luke told us that they gathered because they had seen what the great signs he just never told us what it was and why didn't he? I believe he was doing the exact same thing the first two writers did, was they were protecting Lazarus. Because the word was out, they're after him, and we're not amping that up. So we're not stirring it up because they're after him. You don't have to believe that. That's what I believe. Because I, I, we see it in different parts of that and, and, and in the writing of the, the Gospels, and I believe they were doing it there for Lazarus. So who fills us in? John does. Why? Because he's at a whole different point of time when he writes his gospel. And he can tell us stuff that the other gospels didn't tell us. All right, go, go to the next one. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They're talking to themselves. Because they've been trying to handle Jesus in all kinds of ways and different ways that they've talked and tried to plan within themselves. And none of it's working. And they're arguing with themselves. You see... Uh, that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him because they're seeing both all these Galileans and the people coming up from Jerusalem that had, that had heard about the resurrection and they were all there together. People in the city that were coming were saying, who is this person? This is Jesus of Nazareth. But, but they had a core that shocked the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, then the next thing happened. Look at this in Luke. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. Now, who talks like that? I mean, who talks like that? Who says, hey, think about it. I'm only doing this once. I'm only coming this way once. And I'm coming on the donkey, I'm offering peace, and the Bible says they're going to be cheering and singing the praises. And if you won't fulfill it, I'll have the rocks do it. Who talks like that? Creator God talks like that. Creator God man. The Creator God man was on that donkey riding into the city offering peace. Who was that man? That's the man who said, peace be still. And the storm immediately stopped. The wind stopped blowing. The seas got calm. They had to row themselves in. Because <laughs> they, they were just dead in the water. 
And the first thing those guys said, who's in our boat? Who is this man? Who, what kind of man is this who can tell the winds and the waves to stop? I'll tell you who, creator God man. Creator God man. And then they're out there on a storm and who comes walking by on the water is Jesus. Let me tell you, you don't, you don't walk on, on, on water like this that's all wavy and all. You can't walk on that kind of water. You can walk on a peaceful water when the Lord's doing it. Do you understand? So where he was walking, there was peace in the midst of the storm. In the midst of the storm, anywhere he walked, there was peace. And he's just walking across in peace in the midst of that storm. They thought he was a ghost. But he wasn't a ghost. He was the creator God man. And it's the creator God man who's pulling up to Jerusalem. It's the creator of everything who's offering peace to them. You know what? They didn't accept the peace from the creator God man. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You didn't know the day of your visitation. So now every stone is going to come down. There'll be nothing left. Not one stone upon another. Another gospel talks about that he came to Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers its chicks, but you would not have it. You would not have it. You know the song where the guys were singing? I looked up, I saw my Lord a-weeping over my sins. He was weeping over Jerusalem's not letting him in. He said, I would have done something with you, but I can't do it because you won't let me. How many times has he wept over us? How many times has he looked at our individual life and, and if you could see the heart of the Lord, he's weeping for you, saying they're missing so much. They're not letting me. Oh, what I would have done, but they're not letting me. I don't know how many places he's wept over me, but I'd like him to stop. You know what I'm saying? I'd like him to stop. I'd like him to look out at his church and not weep over us for what we're not doing, but to rejoice over us for what we are doing. Because whenever we're doing the, the, the things that he's called us to, we're not doing our stuff anyway. We're doing his stuff. He doesn't weep that he doesn't weep about, uh, you know, our stuff's going to burn up anyway, but he's weeping over what he can accomplish through us. What's being lost. And, you know, I, I read this this thing about the uh, the stones uh, and I didn't I didn't know what it meant. Well, you know, what is it to have stones cry out? You know, they got suddenly they got lips and they're. And you know, all lips crying out, you know, like a cartoon or something. What, what is that? Uh, look what it says here. Look at this last verse we're going to look at in, in, in John. It says, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was what? When Jesus was revealed, they got understanding. When Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So now they had seen what it was about the march in, what it was about them rejecting him, what it was when he was revealed in his power, because in his power, they were changed. They couldn't see it when it was hidden, but when they saw it, they were changed. So what has to happen for a change to happen? We've got to see Jesus for who he is. See, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you've got to be able to see that moment for it to change your life. The Spirit's got to open that door that your eyes are open and then you can say yes. And now the process starts. And then if you're going to walk with him, that has to continue. He continually has to reveal himself for you to become what's next. You are changed from glory to glory. From revelation of God to revelation of God. And he's taking you on a ride to where you're going to be. Now I'm going to tell you a story. You don't have to believe it. But I still believe God works with people. I still believe he does incredible things. And uh, I'm going to tell you my story. You know, I could tell you somebody else's story, but the Bible does say that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and somebody else's story. Is that what it says? What does it say? We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. 
See, when I, when I tell you this testimony, all it does is remind me where God's brought me. When I tell you what God has done, it, 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 it reminds me, and it's good for you to tell your testimony of what God has done. Anyway, this is my story. You don't have to believe it. You can think that God doesn't do this kind of stuff, and you might as well didn't say I'm crazy because I'm about to tell you a big story. <laughs> because it is. It, it changed my life. Anybody remember the Epworth Quartet? Anybody remember the Epworth Quartet? You know, they went around singing this whole area based out of Laurel, out of Epworth Church. And uh, I joined them in 1984. 1984. In that first year, they, they didn't have their bus. They got their bus in the second year I was with them. Uh, in that first year, they had a van that they then had a trailer behind it that they put all the PA equipment in. And so all seven guys, we had musicians and singers to make the quartet. And so all seven guys would ride in that van and go places. So I, I joined them in 84. We had our, I had our, our first concert with them in March. And it was in the summer, we went to a place called Willard's Camp. Anybody remember Willard's Camp? Anybody ever remember that place? Nobody in the room remembers what, you, there's a few hands back there, okay. Hallelujah, I thought there had to be some kind of witness left over from Willard's Camp. You know, there was Laurel Camp, Willard's Camp, Carrie's Camp, these different places that they would have summer meetings, preachers would come, singers would come, and they'd give invitation, and people would give their hearts to the Lord. Well, Willard's Camp was where we were going, and we went there, and we sang, and it was a great night. It was, it's a little smaller camp there, but the people responded great, and it, I thought the service was going, going well. Uh, Johnny Revel was the preacher that night. Anybody remember Johnny Revel? He preached that night, and he, he, he got done, gave the altar call, and there were too many people for Johnny to minister to. There, there were just too many people came up. And he said, hey, hey, guys, fellas, help me out, talking to the quartet. And so we're going up to these people, and we're praying with them. And I got to pray with three of them. That's how many people were there, because I prayed with three of the people, them, uh, myself. One was a marriage that was falling apart. Uh, and they were there weeping and apologizing to one another because God had touched them through everything that had happened. So that was wonderful. I got to pray with them, and literally God was putting that marriage back together. I got to pray with another couple about something that was going on with them. It wasn't about divorce or anything, but they came up there. I got to pray with them. A 14, 15-year-old girl came up, gave her heart to the Lord. I got to lead her to the Lord in prayer, you know, because God had done that through the service and the preaching. And so that's the three I got to pray with. You know, and we got done there. It was a great time. We're all this, that, that was wonderful that that happened. What a good move to be part of. And, and we packed everything up and we got in our van and we're going home. So we're driving from Willard's camp to the back roads headed to Millsboro to, to drop Charlie Morris off, who was our bass player. He lived in Millsboro at the time. So we're, we're, we're driving to take him home. And I don't know, maybe we're about halfway there. And we hit a soybean field. I'm a farmer, so I know what a soybean field <laughs> looks like. But we hit a soybean. Now, this is at night, but it was a beautiful night. Full moon, stars. You could see the, the light of the moon just glistening off the top of the soybeans. You could see the trees in the background and the outline of the, the darkness behind it and the stars. It was, it was beautiful. And we hit, we hit this soybean field, and it was, it was going to take us maybe what, 10 seconds to ride past the soybean field? And we were in the van, and uh, uh, in that van, they had seats that faced each other. So literally, I'm, I'm in a seat looking the way we're driving, but then there's a seat in front of me, and there's people. Actually, it was Jeff. Jeff was our drummer, our sound man, was our drummer at that time. He was in the seat looking right at me. Charlie Morris wasn't on a seat because there were seven of us in there, and sometimes somebody had to sit on the, the floor of the van. He was sitting on the floor with his foot in the step up thing at the sliding door. So he's looking at me there. And we're just having, you know, it was a good time. So we're all talking and everybody laughing and doing whatever. And all I can tell you is here's what happened. It was like if somebody took a dial on a radio and just dialed it off. It just went quiet. I'm sitting in there where I'm looking at everybody's talking, laughing, and suddenly they're all going away. Now, nothing's happening to my eyes. I'm looking right at them, but they're being shut off. It's like they're just going right out. I don't hear them. And I'm like, what's going on? And I look out the window, and here's the soybean field and the beautiful moon and the stars and the trees. 
And this is all I can tell you what happened. It was, it was almost like a heartbeat, like a foo, foo, foo. Only this is what it was doing. God, 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 God. I'm looking out at this, at these soybeans, at the trees, at the moon, at the stars, and they were saying, God, God. Now, inside, everything's off. Outside, there's a whole new sound system on. It's creation saying, God, God, God. Now, I don't know how this happens and why it happens when you're in the midst of stuff, but one thing I go, hey, is that what Jesus meant when he said he was going to let the stones cry out? I mean, I'm in this experience, and I'm thinking about the Word of God. I'm like, hey, that's like the stones crying out. The, the creation is literally calling out to God. Something else happened because I, I couldn't, I, I didn't feel anything in my body. It was like there was no pressure in my body. It's like I'm just kind of not there. And I remember thinking, if this is dying, it's not so bad. <laughs> I remember thinking, if this is dying, it isn't so bad. So if this is dying, it's not so bad. It, it, it's pretty crazy. Now I'm looking at creation, and creation is going, God, God, God. You know, the Bible says, Paul says, that the creation groans for its redemption. It says it's waiting for you and me to come to the right place that they would be redeemed also, that creation would be redeemed. Now, how does Paul know that? How does Paul know that creation is calling out to God. I would say he probably had an experience. But I know this was happening to me. And all of creation is crying out to God. God, God. The next thing I'm feeling is that I don't feel like I'm going to be here long. I, I just felt like at any moment I would be at the throne of God. I felt like any moment I was going to be in his presence. And something started happening. And I can only describe it like this. Fire. I didn't see fire. It was like spiritual fire was in my life. And do you know what spiritual fire does? Anybody know? It purifies. That's right. You know, the Bible says we're all going to be judged one day and all of our works are going to come before the Lord. We're going to be tried by fire. And it says for some of us, we're going to lose everything. Everything's going to be burned up, but yet we'll still be saved because we were trusting. But some of us aren't going to do a very good job. That's what it says. Well, all I can say is I felt fire and the fire was burning up stuff. Now, if somebody had interviewed me back there at Willard's camp and said, Rick, how's it going in your spiritual life? I said, man, it's going good. I'm in with this group now. We're singing. We just had a great concert and all these people came up to the altar and I got to pray for a marriage here and a marriage there and got to lead that, that teenager there to the Lord. I, I'm in, the, I'll tell you what, I'm in the right place. I'm at the, I'm at the top of my game. Things are going well, sir. That's probably what I would have said. Things are going well. And now I'm simply riding from Willard's camp halfway to Millsboro and I don't feel any of that. Things aren't going so well now. I feel like I might be in the presence of God at any moment and fire is burning up stuff. It's not about heaven and hell. Understand this. I never had any fear about hell. I was, I was going to be with God. There was no fear about hell. I was his. You understand? I gave my heart to the Lord and I was serious and I wasn't turning from that. I was, I was pursuing God. It wasn't about heaven and hell. But it was about, if you're going to get before God, stuff gets burned up on the way. And I had so much stuff burning up. And it was like going through my mind, this, this, this. It's all burning up in the presence of God. Everything you can think of. Every aspect of my life, stuff was burning up. And it got to the place where I began to cry out to God. I would say, God, don't take me like this. Don't let me go like this. Let me have another chance. Let me go back. Let me do differently in life. 
Now see, I don't, I don't know why I came to that. I'm just telling you, it was just the presence of God. The stuff was burning up and I'm saying, give me another chance. Let me go back. Because I felt at any minute, I wasn't going to be in that place. I was going to be with him. And the pressure was on. The creation is crying out to God. The fire is burning. And I think at any minute, I'm going to be in his presence. And my spirit started saying, don't let me go like this. And as I was saying that and crying out, suddenly the creation is going down. And in the van, everything's coming back up. I stop hearing this. And I'm, the voice, the, the, somebody turns the dial back up and I'm, I'm back in the van. I hear all the voices and people laughing. I remember feeling, feeling the pressure in my body again. And I was going like this. I wanted to know that my heart was beating. <laughs> I, I was just going like this. Charlie Morris, the first time I ever told this story was at Epworth when a speaker couldn't come. And they, they were trying to find a speaker. So they, they asked me quickly, said, could you speak since our speaker didn't come? And I ended up telling this story. And Charlie came to me. He said, I, was, I remember that night. I remember I was sitting there looking up at you and you were going like this. He said, and I, and I thought, what are you doing that for? <laughs> he remembers me beating my chest because I was trying to feel life again. Because it was like now pressure was back in my body. And something had changed. Now we're headed to, to Charlie's house, and I can't talk. I can't talk. I, I, was, I was, whatever I had experienced, it had shut me down. And now I can't talk. And we ride from there to Charlie Morris's house, and we're getting out, and I'm going to get in the car with uh, Bill Sammons Jr. We're going to ride home. And, uh, and Dale was driving, Dale Deuce was driving the van, and he goes... Uh, You've been awful quiet tonight, Rick. Everything okay? And I couldn't talk to him. I grunted. I went, hmm. You know, like, uh. I really, I'm serious. You know, it's hard to, to believe and explain. I just grunted at him. I couldn't say, no, I'm okay. I just grunted. I don't remember getting in the car and what we said at all in, in, in anything on the way home. I, I have no memory of my ride from Millsboro to my house. I couldn't tell you what happened there. When I got to the house, I couldn't talk to Gail. I couldn't talk to Gail. I didn't talk to Gail. I go upstairs, get in bed. She's like, you okay? And I'm like, and I couldn't talk to her. So now she's in bed, I'm in bed. And I can't talk. It goes to about, I don't know, three o'clock, somewhere around there. And finally... I felt like I had processed enough that I could even talk. And I touched her. I said, I think I can tell you now. And as I told her, I wept. And just telling her about these things. Let me tell you some of the stuff I had to tell her. I, I told her about the stuff that was burning up in my life. I, I, I said, one of them was, was work. I said, anything at work that was not for Christ burned up. Anything at work. We only work for God that counts. No matter what you do. Whatever you are. You know the Bible says work as unto the Lord. Why is that? Because that's the only thing that will remain. Everything else about work is going to go away. Money. Do you know if you go to work for money, that's going to be burned up? We don't go to work for money. We don't. We work as unto the Lord. You know what we do with money? We meet the needs of the things we have to do. We use money as a vehicle for whatever God is doing. We don't go to work for it. Money does not own you, and it should not persuade any decision you make. From that moment on, my life was changed when it came to money. I wasn't going to not do something for money, and I wasn't going to be made to do something for money. Money no longer had that influence. And, and that's a wonderful thing. When, when that happens to you, I didn't make it happen. It happened because of that, that night. And have I been perfect in it? No, because I got back in this culture. But I remember what happened to me for that time period. And I'm telling her that time wasters, TV, you know, back then it would have been TV. 
Today, Facebook, Twitter, who knows all the stuff that is our time wasters. All that burned up. I don't want to ask, but how much time do you spend in all that kind of stuff? Let me tell you how much of it's going to stay. Let me tell you how much of that is storing up treasure in heaven. Not much. Come on, do you understand? Time wasters were burned up. And, and imagine what all those things were. I, I went to work the next day and I was a different man at work. I mean, it's incredible when you've had this experience and you go into work and now you're not there for any other reason except what can God do at work? What can God do at that? That was 1984 I went into work like that. About three years later, True Value is coming to our hardware store to find out what we're doing because we are their fastest growing hardware store in the country. What happens when it's not about you when you're in your business? Then the whole world comes and says, we don't understand. Why? What's going on with you? How are you doing this? You're in the middle of a soybean field for crying out loud. How can you be this store? And I said, I'm a Christian. I, I'm living like God's told me to live, and everybody wants to do business here. Can you teach? I don't think you can teach that to your people. But how does that start? It starts when it's not about you. It's not about the money. It's not about, it's letting God be glorified in what you do. And then God will show up blessing it. And, and if you can get to where money can't control you, but God does, your life will be different. And, and when you get that stuff doesn't control you, but God does, your life will be different. And spiritually, I was different. Spiritually, I was looking at everything differently. Do you know how phony we are? I mean, we're so phony. We got, we got masks for everything. But imagine if God's spirit is burning away the mask. Now you have to be real. And there's going to be people that try to get that real covered back up. Don't be real. Real changes stuff. Real has blessing following. Surely goodness shall follow me. How many days? All the days of my life. It's going to be pursuing you if God's got his place. And so I'm having to tell Gail all these places that are, that are burning up. And then I had to start my day and could feel that I was different. I was weird. <laughs> I was weird because I, I virtually had the culture burned out of me of whatever that culture was in 84. Went to work, I could feel it there. I was like, I'm a different person here. And now my aspect on everything was that much more of what God would have. When I came home, I, I, I never touched the TV because I didn't want to touch it. Can you imagine that? I had a TV. I didn't want to touch it. So I came home, so now I, I've, I, I told her what happened to me that night. We go to work the next day, and, and I've not heard the TV at all. I come home, and I'm upstairs, and somebody turned on the TV, either Gail or somebody. And so for the first time, I'm hearing the TV since this happened, and I'm walking down the steps, and in the living room, there was the TV. Dan Rather was on. The CBS News, 1964. Dan Rather's just doing his regular thing on the news. And I felt like I wanted to throw up. I literally felt like I wanted to throw up. And so I was nauseated. So I got out of the room. I got out of the room. And, and I went outside. And I was like, Lord, what is going on with me? <laughs> but I knew what was going on. I wasn't over what happened to me. Remember Moses went up and saw the glory of God. He came down with the glow of the Lord on him. And he had to put a veil on. You know, we never hear about that veil coming off, but I think it did. I think it did over time. It faded away. Because that's just a high moment. That's going to fade away. Then you have to live in the culture. Well, this was my high moment. I, I didn't even want to hear the TV. It took me three weeks before I could just turn on the TV and listen to it. Three weeks. But I got back there. But I know what it is now. You understand? I know what it is now. Uh, you can watch it and it's entertaining and whatever, but what's going to last? Because that's going to burn up in his presence. Come on, do you understand? And, and so my life began to be changed. 
And he began to use that as a course corrector for where he was going. He will put you through experiences for where he's taking you. And, and, and look where I'm at. This is where he was. This is one of the places he was taking me. And you know what he, he decided to do? He said, I've got to have this experience in his life. He's got to know the value of that. And see, so, so we're going to be out here and we're going to break ground. And, and I guess people are just worried about us because it's going to go to our heads. We're doing it for our egos. We're doing it for whatever. And it's comical to me. Because I know what God has done. I guarantee you, I don't need two more buildings to take care of in this, this grouping. This, this one's just fine. Do you understand? We got four services. You know what? I don't even want four services. But we've got four services. And the fifth one, if you count the, the, the Spanish service. But yet it's not about what I'd want. You know what I'd want? I want to be making lots of money, take my vacations where I want to go and just have a, have a blast. You know, just relax. Have, have some of the good life or whatever they're talking about. You know what? That, that's what my flesh would do. Let me just chill from you guys. It's not about that. Do you understand? It's not about that. It is about, you know, what, what is Christ doing? He's not trying to make me have a good day. He's trying to make me look like him. It's about him taking me captive for his life. I am his captive now. Now, woe is me if I don't teach or preach the gospel. Woe is me if I don't do four services. Woe is me if we don't build. Come on, do you understand? God can bring you to a place that he has you in his hands, and now he can direct. And people can say, I, we don't understand. That's all right. Let them don't understand. We have to understand what is God doing with us. What is it the, the, the creator God has come to our door and offered to us? What is creator God saying that we need to say yes to? Why is it it's not going to be me or, or Pastor Bill or uh, Pastor Marv and us out there with our shovels and you all looking at us? Come on, why is it going to be us out there? Because God hasn't called a man. He hasn't called a few leaders. He hasn't called crossroad. He's called his people to do a work. And I believe this is where he's directed us to do a work. And that's why we're going to get, gather together. Because we're going to say, we get it. We understand. We see it. And maybe that's not for you. And maybe you're not planning on coming back. You're not bringing a shovel. And you're just, well, good, that's not for me. Well, then chances are, maybe that's not for you. But whoever does come, whoever does come, because God brings them to that moment, the power is going to be there to get the job done too. Whoever does come is going to have the blessing of the call and the purpose. And we're going to be united in where God has taken us. And it's going to be incredible because we have not seen yet what God has told us is going to happen to this. And God says, I will do more than you could ask or think. And so that's the kind of blessing we're riding in. And when, I, when I started working in the hardware store, I didn't know what to do in that hardware store. I just asked God, what do I do? And he started telling me, I didn't know the end result would be true value coming to me saying, what are you doing? Because you're our fastest growing store in the nation. Do you understand? All we can do is say, yes, God, what do you want where we are? We don't have a clue how much God wants to do. But I believe I want to be ready for it. I want to be in agreement, not only with my heart toward him, but I want to be in agreement with my brothers and sisters. Are you ready to go forward with what God is doing here? Come on, church, are you ready to do it? Why don't you stand? Stand on up. All we can do is when the Prince of Peace comes, that we say yes. That we allow what he wants to do. Oh, what I would have done, but you would not have it. I don't want that to be what he says about this fellowship. I want it to be, oh, what I would have done, and we got to see a lot of it. I want to be able to say, the Lord got to see a lot of what he, I, I am sure we've already missed things. I'm sure our, our mess ups have already held back what God could have done in this place. But I want to keep saying to us, yes, as much as we can say yes to. 
and see the things of God. And you may be here this morning and maybe you don't even know him as Lord and Savior. You've not received him personally. You've never said a prayer of asking him in as your Lord and Savior, but you can do it today. If the Spirit of God is drawing you, if you're acknowledging that He died on the cross for your sins, and you know, just like that day for me when the Spirit was doing something in my heart, you know God's doing something in yours. You know He's drawing you in. Well, that's your day to say yes. When the Prince of Peace is at the heart, the door of your heart, let Him in. When you hear Him knocking, let Him in because He's about ready to do for you something you could never do for yourself. And He will reveal Himself to you, but only the heart that humbles itself before you before him if that's you i'll lead you in a prayer committing your heart your life everything to the lord and your brothers and sisters that understand they're going to be glad for you and they'll even say the prayer with you but you've got to be bold in front of men and women and start declaring jesus as your lord and savior and raise that hand and say it's me it's me i want to receive him today as lord and savior if that's you raise your hand up high we'll say this prayer with you anybody in the room that needs that prayer Anybody in the room? All right, I don't see any hands. I'm going to trust you've done that. All right, church, we got seven days. This is about the best seven days we're going to have. If we can't invite or encourage somebody during Easter, boy, have we missed it. You know, let's, let's really, let's be asking God every day, what would you have me do today? Stop making it about us. You know, stop, stop having every week just turn out the same way. Let the Lord lead you and see the incredible. Give him that vessel he died for. You say you're a Christian, you're a believer. Well, wake up and give it to God every day. Watch what he'll do with you. Are you ready to have a great seven days? Yes. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for my brothers and my sisters. Thank you for the word we're able to share. Thank you for the event of the groundbreaking. We just ask for your presence to be in it mightily. Now, Lord, over these next seven days, may we truly have your heart. May we totally seek you out. May we be asking every day, Lord, what would you do with us? Who might we invite? Who might we encourage? Lord, we've got Good Friday to be able to, to bring people in and let them see the message of the cross. We've got Easter that people can come in and see the power of the resurrection and hear that story. Let us be sensitive this week, Lord, of who we might encourage, who we might bring, and that we would see people come to know you as Lord and Savior. May you empower our lives and may Jesus be lifted up. In his name we pray and everybody said. Amen. Amen.